Welcome to the 2019 My OER Summit. Thank you for joining us today. With a raise of hands, I'd like to know how many of you are, this is your first summit attendance. Awesome. Thank you. Um, this could not be done without a lot of hard work from a lot of people. I believe Michelle Pratt is still outside, is she not? Well, I don't see her. Michelle Pratt um, here at Delta College has, at Delta College um, itself, thank you very much for hosting our summit today. Michelle has done an outstanding job, right down to having the, the nice students welcoming us as we walk in the door. That was just a nice touch. So let's give a round of applause. And I'd also like to introduce the rest of the planning team. If they would stand up, please. Tammy Douglas, Edie Erickson. Is she here yet? There she is. OK. Um, Kendra Lake from St. Clair. Tina Ulrich. Gina Lewis from Michigan Department of Ed. There she is in the back. Thank you all of the planning team members. There's one planning team member not here, Regina Gong. Um, unfortunately, she had to be in Washington, D.C. yesterday and today, and she's already um, going through some withdrawal. I, I, we've been texting back and forth since 6.30 this morning, this girl. Um, but she wanted me to say hello uh, from her and that she misses you all terribly. Let me just do a couple of housekeeping event um, items. Um, the beginning of the conference is here, the end of the conference is here. And it'll be important to come back here. We want to try to at least sort of codify some of the things that we've learned today. And we give out prizes. So <laughs> it might be a good idea to just stop back here. Um, all of the sessions are in your, in your um, book, booklet that you've got on the back page is the map. There are other maps out on the table if you want them. Um, but all of the sessions will be in the F wing on the lower level. And lunch will be on the lower level in the commons as well. So uh, we will go from here over to that side and then back to this side at the end of the day. Um, last year, and you know the Michigan Colleges Online, we, we um, do a report every year based on what our colleges tell us about the usage of OER at their campuses. Last year, the Michigan Community College colleges reported that they have saved students an estimated $7,476,000 last year. That's up 29% from the year before, and Michigan Colleges Online has been reporting data from the colleges for the last three years, and I'm happy to report that over the last three years, we have a grand total of 15,872, or 15,872,000. $15 million. $15 that we have saved our students by the use of OER in the classroom. So another round of applause. This year, 20 out of the 28 community colleges in the state of Michigan will be reporting some OER usage on their campus. Um, other items that we're working on um, through our OER steering committee, if you sit on the MCO OER steering committee, can you raise your hand? Thank you. That representatives from each one of the community colleges in the state of Michigan. Um, we're working on a common student survey that we can give out to our students at the different institutions to get some statewide data on what students think about the OER. Um, 
um, we've identified a common division definition for OER so that it can be used as an identifier in the online student registration. And that, that'll be a big thing when we get that all put together. I want to speak briefly about a statewide effort that's going on right now. Um, we're tentatively calling it the MI, MI, OER Network. <coughs> and the steering committee for that group, if you're in the audience, please stand. <clears throat> Christy Motts, Kelly Clark, Regina, Poonam, uh, I don't think Poonam Kumar is here, Gina Loveless again, and we've added two new folks, Scott Garrison and, um, from MCLS and Shannon White. This group has gotten together actually through, thank you ladies, through a um, effort uh, put on by the Michigan or the Midwest Higher Education Compact and actually what it's doing is allowing us in Michigan to develop an OER statewide collaborative so that we can all work together and we're not in silos anymore. We're not going to be K-12 here, community colleges and the universities or the four-year institutions. We'll be working together. Um, if you want to know more about that, we will be having a table at lunch. That's <coughs> just on uh, my OER network and our, and our steering committee will be there. We're in the process right now of putting together some policies for this, finding some funding for this. Um, we will have partner institutions. You may be a partner institution if you want once we get this launched. We have four goals that we're looking at. Professional development and training at all levels. Infrastructure, setting up a, a digital place to um, house many of the materials that we're looking at. Data gathering and assessment and communication outreach and advocacy. So again, um, during lunch, if you're interested in that topic, please uh, look for the table that says My OER Network. Lunch is unique, and if you, for those of you that haven't been here before, when, when we have lunch, we, we, we sit at tables that um, will be discussing something that is of interest to us. So if you're a, a sociology teacher, please sit at the sociology table and meet your peers from other institutions and find out what they're doing. Um, that's and librarians, we have a librarian table. We want you to network and meet other people from other institutions. So um, <clears throat> if you'd be interested in that, you're more than welcome to. I'm done speaking now. I'm going to turn this over to uh, uh, Dr. Martha Crowler. She's the Dean of Teaching and Learning here at Delta College. Thank you, Rhonda. Delta College is so happy to be able to host the, the 2019 My OER Summit, and we are very, very pleased to be able to welcome all of you individually to our campus today. Isn't this just a gorgeous Michigan day, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> these, these are the days that you're glad to say you live in Michigan. In January, we may have a different story, but on days like today, we say we love Michigan. Delta College is very pleased to be able to support the OER movement and the things that are happening to support students through that. We started keeping records in about 2017, about two years ago. Since then, we have about quadrupled the amount of money that we've saved students, estimating that we'll be saving students approximately $84,000 this year, this fall, fall semester at Delta College, $84,000 to our students, which is wonderful. We're just so thrilled to see that happening. This savings allows more students to be able to access college. And that's one of the topics that our speaker will also be addressing today, if I understand the subject. <laughs> Jess Mitchell is with us today. And Jess is a senior manager, is a senior manager for research and design at the Inclusive Design Research Center at the Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto. There's a mouthful. She has done many, many things, including work at Ghana, work at Duke University, and many different government and nonprofit workshop support. She has a background in ethics, and with that can bring a very unique perspective 
to this important topic as we move into the 21st century in higher education. Please join me in welcoming Jess Mitchell. Thank you. All right, that, all, that makes me sound way more exciting than I am. <laughs> um, shout out, who tweets? Okay, tweeters, uh, your hashtag today is M-I-O-E-R Summit. Michigan OER Summit. Um, give me just a second here. So, I got a lot of things I want to talk to you about today, and it's early in the morning, but I'm going to overwhelm you. <laughs> so settle in. Um, there we go. I like to begin a presentation uh, with a kind of free association about a place. And for Michigan, um, my free association begins first with the mitten. Um, everybody. <laughs> and then at Eastern Market. Uh, it was the first farmer's market that I had been to where there were more people of color than there were white folks with very expensive strollers and to-go artisanal coffee cups in their hands. Um, it was there that I saw some kids from Detroit selling tomatoes and cucumbers from the gardens that they tended um, from uh, on the empty city lots. I met Yemeni farmers. I mean, I knew it was Eastern Market, but I didn't know it was that far <laughs> east. I bought mushrooms from an infamous compost pile in Leamington, Ontario, which then felt very exotic. And I learned that the best pickles come from Detroit, period. I love the cultures mixing. I love the people who were there to buy healthy food from each other, to feed their families amongst the devastating economic conditions with the food that they were growing themselves. There was something very empowering about it. Um, and there are plenty of stories and publications all over that celebrate the, in that celebrate the innovation and the drive to care for your community that we see in some of the hardest hit places in America, Detroit. Um, and Detroit's Eastern Market is no exception. I felt as though I could feel the community pride, um, the sense of taking care of your own when the government or the state fails. Um, that kind of resilience and resistance to me is captured in breathtaking form in the Diego Rivera murals at the uh, Detroit Institute of Arts. Rivera, a Mexican artist, was perhaps the perfect person to create these pieces, a Mexican Marxist. When I walked in to see these murals, they bombarded me from floor to ceiling with depictions of the means of production, of industrialization, and the impact and the costs of that industrialization on the people. Uh, this is Motor City we're talking about. Modern advances, the V8 engine, vaccinations, technology, medicine, and these frescoes were done during the Depression. So we have the modern juxtaposed with these multicolored working class, some of whom are faceless. Their hands reach up from the rubble, and they remind us that there were strikes and workers shot in the Ford Motor Factory in Dearborn. Light pours into the indoor courtyard from above, and from the open doors on either end. Light, hope, resilience, the future. And at the time these pieces were completed in the 30s, there was a lot of controversy. This is a Marxist artist from Mexico. It was the depression and times were tough. And there were questions like, why is an, a Mexican artist doing this work in a city that's so quintessentially American? Why not? A, American artists making America great again. It was called foolishly vulgar and un-American, the politics. The upper classes didn't like that the working classes were invading their museum in the form of this mural. Museums were for a particular kind of person, just like farmer's markets. 
And it's uncomfortable when they mix. And some people felt like it was much more civilized back then when they were kept separate. So in the 50s, the museum put a disclaimer on the mural calling Rivera's politics detestable. So think of that the next time you go to a museum and you read that little, that little placard of information next to the piece. Who wrote it? What did they include? What did they omit and why? Mixing indeed, working together, united. This was threatening then, just as it is now. And the resistance carries on. Um, as of the end of 2017, you all know this, 24% of the schools in the district in Detroit had no art class. 27, uh, sorry, had an art class. That means, quick math. Uh, thank you, 76. 76 had no art class. 27% had a music class and only 18% had both. And for many years, many years meaning in the order of decades, the Detroit Institute of Arts was the arts education for kids in Detroit. Uh, these are the adults, the children, the grandchildren of the working classes from Motor City. So many of them, no arts, no music education. They do, however, come to the museum, 70,000 students a year, and they see the stories of their families working to build an industrialized world and suffering the byproducts of that. And the staff at the DIA are doing some pretty extraordinary things with very little. Instead of trying to do the sorts of things that better funded museums are doing, like building a digital archive, creating digital catalogs, making an iPhone app, the DIA was being innovative and using basic tools, pencils, paper, and asking the students to engage, the kids to engage with the art that they were walking through. They didn't focus on how important it is for these kids to know who the Medicis were. They tried to connect the kids to the art along something that was meaningful to them. They were resilient in the face of the threat, made a number of years back to sell the art off to get the city out of bankruptcy. Imagine the Diego Rivera murals being sold, the economics, the ethics, the impact, the irony. And what about the economics, the ethics, and the impact of water? Who gets clean water and why? We have this issue in Ontario as well. What's the history that leads to the dirty water in Flint? We know it, and it's a story of people in power drawing ethical lines in the sand determining the haves and the have-nots. If Flint were Gross Point, would there still be water issues? Who decides? Everybody got really quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> you see, as Martin Luther King tells us, a lack of physical violence does not equal peace. A lack of verbal disagreement does not equal peace. Order does not equal peace. Following the rule of law does not always equal peace. Sometimes laws are used to hold people down. True peace is not merely the uh, absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. And in water, in art, in food, in Michigan, do we see justice. I'm grateful to be here today on this Anishinaabe walkie land that we um, are on to challenge our assumptions, to tickle our brains, to open our minds just a little bit. And I ask that you do the following. Um, pay attention to two things. Remember two things that I say. And they may be things that you don't quite understand or you don't agree with. They may be things that you really like. They may be things that make you think a little bit differently. But I want you to hold on to those two things because that's going to be the way that we start the conversation at the end. So we all like certainty, neatness, completion absolutes, fixed inflexibles, in the quest to be fair, efficient, to scale, and to achieve measurable outcomes, we're doing damage though. But why do we do this? I want to explore some of the reasons. We all sort differently. Color, size, shape, balance, age, smell, texture, feel. And we feel a completeness and a satisfaction in the way we choose to slice the world. And we feel delight 
and we buy more of the things when the way that they're presented to us delights us or tickles our minds. I call them delicious mind delights. And sometimes we feel compelled to fix a thing. Like how many of you are disturbed right now by the one puzzle piece? Yeah, yeah. you just want to move it. Um, so we all do this. Um, we know that that's where the puzzle piece should be. Or we yell at our spouse who doesn't put the knife where the knife should be. There's a proper place for the knife. We're all guilty of this. So you've got eggs sorted by hue, colors in a cup. You've got people who travel with Tom bin bags. I am not one of them, but I understand that they like to take pictures of all of the things that fit into their bags and post them onto Instagram. It's a little bit like posting your lunch on Instagram. <laughs> so we've got this puzzle piece that's irking some of us. And how many of you have a utensil drawer that looks like this? I have to shake mine to get it open. <laughs> and that might tell you everything you need to know about me, but I'm not. And we've got somebody who's organized their spices very neatly. Incidentally, when my sister was a kid, uh, she decided to organize my mother's spice cabinet by color. My mom couldn't find any of the spices. <laughs> And then we've got this beautiful bird who shows us natural symmetry that appeals to us on this visual perspective. And we come by this tendency, I think, biologically as well as culturally. We've inherited the grid from early metaphysics. We like to sort and order things. These are our cities, Chicago, Boston, <laughs> Anchorage, Detroit, uh, let's see, Miami, New York, Portland, San Francisco, Salt Lake City, St. Louis, Washington. They're all built on an ever so slight variation on a grid theme. If you follow the grid back, you see its focus on a point, historically, characterized in the late medieval Christian world. The point where it all begins, creation. And then we have the Renaissance, and the Cartesian grid, the move from the sacred to the secular, the grid embodies more of a field where points and axes are marked by quantitative values, the scatter plot. This grid, the field of points, we used in global exploration and discovery. It makes neat little boxes, and those boxes demarcate specific spaces and locations. Take a look at the states in the upper Midwest. They were parceled out in squares. The map tells that history. The highways are either east-west or north-south, but rarely diagonal. Just try driving from Saginaw to Kalamazoo. And then with Descartes, the grid made an important leap from not only the physical, the neat little boxes, but also to the problem-solving and the decision-making in later 20th century design. The grid came to represent not only the structural laws, and principles behind the physical appearances, but the process of rational thinking and decision-making itself. This can be seen and manifest in the great French geometric gardens, literally the application of the Cartesian grid to the exterior landscape. And intellectually, it can be seen as manifest in our fondness and arguable over-reliance on data that is all around us today. Stop for a moment and consider all the grids in your life, all the grids around you that structure your life. What impact do they have on you, on your actions, on your decisions, on the haves and the have-nots? What if instead it was something in the middle, something between? What if the edges were looser, the rules more flexible, the sorting less exact and more messy? And this applies not only to the sorting we do with what we collect, but it, it permeates earlier in our process and what we decide is worth measuring at all. What do we measure? Well, the measurable, of course. We measure those things that are easily measured and then we use the answers, the results of that measurement to make our disembodied data-driven decisions. You're thinking, oh crap, I do that. We all do. We're measuring admissions, we're measuring retention, 
We're measuring graduation. We're measuring the cost for the year. We're measuring regurgitation of information. And we feel comfy because we feel like we know. If we make our scope that small, then we're going to get true measures. It, if it's hard to measure, we often ignore it. Because without measures, without data, we can't make claims about it. We can't have that sense of certainty, can we? Uh, we're okay with this false confidence that this measurement gives us and this blurry feeling of completion. We treat data as if it's a pure form of certainty. It's science, it's true, it's exact, it's untainted. We give numbers a kind of primacy, treat them like a pure objective truth. Numbers themselves aren't truth especially when the numbers concern people and their uniquenesses. We all know it's not true. Microbes, acid rain, pollution are all in that mountain stream. And our data is littered too with bias, inaccuracies, willful ignorance, with poor analysis. You don't have to look too far nowadays to read about the dangers of data collected without ethics or even deep introspection. Have a look at AI or machine learning. When the systems fail, how often do we hear, we just need more data? <laughs> They're not as smart as they can be with more data. And why are we so forgiving of these systems? And take a look at what more than 800 scientists have done. They've called for an end to statistical significance. They show that 51% of the time, <laughs> it's interpreted incorrectly. That's a compelling number. <laughs> in this article in Nature, they say, when was the last time you heard a seminar speaker claim there was no difference between two groups because the difference was statistically non-significant? How do stat uh, statistics so often lead scientists to deny differences that those not educated in statistics can plainly see? For several generations, researchers have been warned that a statistically non-significant result does not prove the null hypothesis. The hypothesis that there's no difference between groups or no effect of a treatment on some measured outcome. Nor do statistically significant results prove some other hypothesis. Such misconceptions have famously warped the literature with overstated claims 51% of the time. Let's be clear about what must stop. We should never conclude there is no difference or no association just because a p-value is larger than a threshold such as 0 0.05 or equivalently because a confidence interval includes zero. But p-value, confidence intervals, I mean confidence, it sounds good. <laughs> Those are the things of certainty, right? And they explain that the trouble is in us. It's in our own dichotomania. And we must stop this crazy dichotomania. The trouble is human and cognitive more than it's statistical. Bucketing results into significant, significantly significant and significant, statistically non-significant makes people think that the items assigned in that way are categorically different. The same problems likely arise under any proposed statistical alternative that includes dichotomization, frequentist, Bayesian, or otherwise. This, by the way, those 51% of the studies, that's the data we're making our disembodied data-driven decisions upon. Now you're like, oh crap. <laughs> this is getting serious. Many of us attempt to absolve ourselves of hard things like inclusion by deferring to a higher power. The higher power we appeal to is often data. We collect a bunch of data, and then we make data-driven decisions, which sounds really good, right? And when we do that, we need to ask, how do data-driven decisions do harm? First of all, if you're a member of a marginalized community, a minority, you will never be represented in big data if we focus on the majority, the bang for your buck. And collectively, the 20% not the 80%, represent a large, diverse, and often forgotten group, one that's harder to solve for, one that benefits the 80%. Think of text messaging, curb cuts, electric toothbrushes. All those innovations were created for the 20%. Anybody use those? 
When information is more important in knowledge, than knowledge and certainty and measurability are more important than thoughtfulness, risk, wonder, exploration, and discovery, what do we lose? What are we relinquishing? If we value something, we have to be able to measure it. If to value something, we have to be able to measure it and vice versa, what are we overlooking and missing? When measurability itself is success, it becomes an end in itself. We begin asking questions that lead us to measurable answers. We begin measuring those things that are easily measured. And those are not neutral acts. We act on our measurements. This dirty data becomes the tea leaves for decision making, the map for change, the path toward enlightenment. And we feel a sense of comfort having followed the directions given to us from the disembodied data. And we do real harm to real people to the environment, to ourselves, and more. The impact of this is deeply embedded in our lives. Just like the grid, we accept it without much critique, but often we sense it isn't quite right. We know there's more. I mean, look at our methods, too. We know now, I hope, that we need both and, and we're no longer at a place where we can either hide behind data or just tell stories. The quantitative, the qualitative, and the anecdotal. Make a place for all of that and the data you've collected in your well-meaning survey that might be embedded with bias and leading questions and false positives and, and, and. Embrace uncertainty and incompletion and not knowing. Long live wonder and curiosity. We do damage when we succumb to without questioning the naturalized and adopted methods. This just shows numbers or people. Right? This is that false dichotomization that we've got to stop. Statistical results or inspirational stories, both, right? Validate versus explore both. So how many of you have ever exp experienced any of these phenomena? Studying for the grade, valuing assessments, not learning. All interactions are amazing. All meetings are great. <laughs> Nobody ever says, you know, that could have been an email. <laughs> Failure is bad. Exploration, discovery, epiphany, because we can't measure them or validate them are too costly, risky, flimsy. We should focus on measurable, rigorous, data-driven. So this is where we are. How do we end up in this conflict? How do we let spaces shape us in ways that we know don't work? And why do we perpetuate experiences that we know oppress and limit? Why? So what you measure is what you value. We measure enrollment, retention, success, the absence of failure, completion, diversity. We measure that usually in demographics. But do we measure these things? Sense of urgency, creativity, teamwork, unselfish giving, grace and dignity, optimism, active listening, critical thinking, curiosity, humility, judgment, positivity, bias toward results or inclusion. These all sound like really good things that you want, right? How do you make sure you're gonna get them? And we know that what you measure is what you value, and the way you measure it is your bias. Who determines the questions to ask the data? How are the questions articulated? We all suffer from a fondness for confirmation bias. How are we con contending with that? Unfortunately, data won't save us unless we rethink the ways we're, rec we're collecting, interpreting, and acting upon its outputs. So where does this tendency toward deferring to data come from? We've explored some ways, but I want to explore one more. I want to suggest, I think, that we've misunderstood or at least misinterpreted what science is. And I'm taking a risk here. I am not a scientist. I majored in philosophy. <laughs> but bear with me. We tend toward a scientism, which is an excessive belief in the power of scientific knowledge and techniques. We reduce everything to science and we treat it as the way to describe all reality and knowledge and the nature of things. 
It must be measurable, verifiable, reproducible, quantitative. It must be logical, rational, and exact. But we know that we are not logical, rational, or exact, right? We treat data like that pure, untouched mountain stream. Are you with me? Am I losing everybody? Okay, you're with me. It just gets really quiet, and I always get nervous. Richard Feynman, the theoretical physicist, brilliant genius of quantum mechanics, says it's our responsibility as scientists to teach how doubt is not to be feared, but welcomed and discussed. What's this? A hardcore scientist saying that uncertainty or doubt are useful? And then we have this article from Rhett Elaine from Southeastern Louisiana University. He wrote this in Wired. It's pithy, but enormously powerful. It's called Science Isn't About the Truth, It's About Building Models. And there's a reference to Joe versus the volcano in this article, which I love. <laughs> it brought me and Rhett together a little bit. He explains these are just models. They aren't the truth. In fact, the only way to know if a model is absolutely true would be to test every possible case that applies to the model. This means testing every situation in the whole universe. Oh, and for all time, beginning with the Big Bang until the end. You can't do that. Don't worry. We have good models. We don't quite understand exactly gravitational interaction, but our models are good enough to get the airplane up and to get the airplane down. We have models for flying spacecraft around our solar system. We have models that are not correct or absolutely true, and yet we can still function. We can do things. We can make decisions, and we can move forward. And if we fail, we can adapt and try again. And we discover new things because we're open to them, open and somewhere in the middle. Scientists feel OK with this. If scientists can't get to the truth, what do they start with? And if they're just models, what are they telling us? This is the stuff that science likes. Discovery and innovation comes from failure. How many of you have learned more from your failures than from your successes? Everybody. Questioning, curiosity, speculating, and then trying to disprove your hypothesis. Are we measuring these? Even science knows that good science comes from never giving up, exploring evermore. And this hasn't thrown scientists down the slippery slope to relativism. They're comfy knowing and not knowing. They still walk on the sidewalks. In fact, they probably feel more secure when they don't know. It means there's no finish line. We have to always explore and explore some more. David Attenborough whom I love, love, love. Doesn't everybody? He's, he's, the, yeah, he's the guy that does all the BBC um, uh, Earth and science and biology um, uh, shows. He said roughly, to great scientists, truth is understood to be truth right now until another truth is discovered. This smells to me like humility and exploration and a lack of completeness that allows us to wonder. And he's not thrown into relativism. So let go, be open, settle somewhere in the middle. And here we have Leslie Chan from the University of Toronto saying, when we think about open science, we have to be careful about whether we're thinking about a monolithic concept. There should be many open sciences. Excluding other ways of knowing is to our detriment. This, a colleague of his calls, is epistemicide, which is a cool word. We have some work to do. When we take this monolithic approach in the sciences, we lose opportunities. There's, this, there's an astrophysicist who started listening to space a number of years ago, listening to the data. She said, you know, we privilege the visuals so much. What can we learn if we just listen to space? Just yesterday, they released some audio clips from Mars. Did anybody listen to those? So cool. All right. And then we have, back to that Diego Rivera mural, the vaccinations. The message of measles, this article in The New Yorker. 
As public health officials confront the largest outbreak in the U.S. in decades, they've been fighting as much against dangerous ideas as they have against the disease. One need not relitigate the case for vaccines here. There have been more than a dozen large-scale peer-reviewed studies, the most recent one done in Denmark involving more than 650,000 children that have no connection between the MMR vaccine and autism. Are there side effects to vaccines? Yes, sometimes. Anyone who's worked in public health knows that eradicating diseases is not just science. That where science intersects with people, you have to build trust. Scientific knowledge isn't enough. Jimmy Carter's Carter Center nearly eradicated guinea worm a number of years ago, and then some rumors started in Nigeria that the vaccine was sterilizing people. Guinea worm did not get eradicated then. Nigerians travel a lot, so it got spread more. You have to build trust, right? We're not always logical, rational beings. In Tanzania, in Nigeria, in India, in Berkeley, California, where well-educated, informed, privileged, we might say, individuals are not vaccinating their children. Whooping cough, measles, we see all of these diseases coming back. We're not doing real science. Real science wonders and explores and wants to be proven wrong. And real science is comfortable knowing and not knowing and not slipping down the slope to relativism, finding a middle. So I want to talk about fairness for a minute and what it is. I think I want to say we're applying the same rules to everyone in the spirit of fairness. Everyone is assessed the same, no exceptions. The assignment is due on this exact date. And again, I think we do this because we aren't sure how to do it in another way. We want to be fair. So we apply the same rules to everyone, but we fail often to ask whose rules are they? Who's making the rules? Are the rules revisited as culture, humans, the economy, health, the environment change? Do the rules flex for special or edge cases that they don't fit? What about current events? And this is a push me, pull you. It's a mythical beast. It's coming and going. It's neither here nor there. I like it. <laughs> it's impossible. So we codify, codify the trans transactions and structure. This is the syllabus. This is what you'll be measured on. Strict adherence with little to no spark will get you a B. Full born deviation will get you a D because an F is just really brutal. And that will be how we measure success. We'll measure you by all by exactly the same criteria because that makes us feel fair, no exceptions. And there'll be no substitutions on your pizza order. But we know this does damage. This is not a neutral act. Achievement is defined by adherence to the syllabus because we need to measure to feel fair, validated, and objective. No bias here, folks. Adherence means achievement. Opportunities are based on achievement over time or just privilege. Opportunities help build skills, gain experience, which parlay nicely into a career, and that's success. If you're disadvantaged or excluded or left out of the measures at the beginning of this game, you never catch up. A high school student in Detroit and a high school student at Phillips Exeter in New Hampshire will not have the same chances at any part of this equation. The playing field is not level, and we're all different. Adherence in many cases means merely conformance to a form, to the game, to give the intended output or the function. If we're getting the first steps wrong, that is measuring achievement, how can we use this as the building block for the rest? Who are we failing? Rules like this, no exceptions. You must report on your department's success by using these measures. Only English speakers can learn from this material. Only graduate students can take this course. Your thoughts must be organized into a five paragraph essay. You cannot use Wikipedia as a reference. You see, nothing we do or say is neutral. It's embedded in our experience and our context. We make choices. Do you make decisions? Then you're a designer and your decisions have impact on others. You're declaring this and not anything else. You might have reasons for it. They might range from that's the way we always do it to the one that my dad always used because I said so. <laughs> to because research shows us it's good for the majority, etc. 
51% statistically insignificant and interpreted incorrectly. If you're making decisions that affect another, then you're designing your designer. So as a designer, you're either going to be part of the revolution or else the status quo. So here's our call to action. We know the rules aren't fair. We like control. We like to know you're getting the theme of this. And we're in a bit of conflict. We want to create safe spaces, but we know we want to push ourselves and others out of our comfort zones. How do we reconcile this? We know that um, monocultures are not often diverse or inclusive, but we hire for them. We sit comfortably in them. We create monocultures, and we largely live in them. We like stability. But we know to innovate, to grow, we need to change. We want to be the best, but we also speak about the value of collaboration. We want to win, but we also want to collaborate. We create an us, and in doing so, it defines a them in the negative space. We want to be positive, inspirational, exciting, but we know that so many of us learned from those negative experiences, from the failures if we allow ourselves to have them and reflect on them. So how do we reconcile these things? There are no black and white answers. These binaries are false. We need both and. and I think that's how we get to inclusion. And we hamstring ourselves by thinking it can be this overly simple. You don't have to choose. Find spaces that understand both. Look at scale, for example, and one-off. Much damage has been done in education in the spirit of scaling an approach, a standard or a framework. Scale to me is code for do the same thing cheaply for many more people. It's an economic decision. It's also an ethical decision. It's an ethical decision to say that one-offs aren't worth it. Ask again for whom and why. What history got us there? We think we know what's good and what's bad, and then something comes and confronts us with both. So we're stuck in these misconceptions that if we explore something from all possible angles, we can know it, predict it, and control it. We can fix it. We can design it. We do this for our students. We also do this for our spouses, our children, our dogs, right? We all do it. And we also like to predict and speculate. The assumptions we make is that roadmaps can be predicted and controlled. Oops, a natural disaster came along I didn't account for. We can know and predict, we can know the problem and create a solution. It can be solved in a standard, linear manner. We can control and predict requirements as an endpoint, and we know what success is. Everything's linear. You start with requirements gathering, how could you go wrong? Well, requirements are evolving, right? Complex projects can't be predicted. They're emergent, complex. Those systems can't be known. They evolve. Success continues to evolve and change. We know that control doesn't work or really exist. But don't despair, folks. Remember, this doesn't put us on a slippery slope to relativism or to nihilism. We need to dig in more. So I suggest that to do this inclusion stuff, we need to do three things. Questioning, reflecting, and disrupting. Question why things are the way they are. What's the history? Where did it come from? Like we did earlier with data. Reflecting on the fairness of that, the justice and the ethics, which we spent a tiny bit of time on with the data methods. And disrupting to make changes in the ruts and the ways of the, we're doing things. Imagine how we might disrupt the way we make decisions in physical and digital spaces. I think curiosity is one of the core ingredients of this inclusion soup. You often hear people say you've got to have empathy when you work in inclusion. Finding empathy is sometimes too big an ask. I think you start with curiosity. As a fondness, I like things in threes. Um, so a lot of my stuff is threes. If there's a fourth that's meaningful to you, I'd love to hear about it, because I'm sure there is a fourth. I want to lead us through some practice of questioning, reflecting, and disrupting. And I want us to remember that the form impacts the function in all these areas. And there's another three. I want to talk about it in the architectural, the experiential, and the interactional. So we're going to start with the architectural. How can we question this? Can we say, is this a desirable learning environment for whom and why? And then reflect and ask, who, decide? who decided? What's the history of this? How did we get here? Your students sitting at a table with a, clearly a teacher in front of the room. 
And then we can disrupt and suggest that this too is a learning environment. The kids in my high school who skipped class and built a half pipe and were working with city police on decriminalizing skateboarding, they were doing a lot of cool stuff. Those are some really wicked school skills to have. How can we question this? Can we say, is this a desirable study environment, this, this sort of storied and, and beautiful library? For whom and why? And then reflect and ask, who decided? What's the history of this? How did we get here? And then disrupt and suggest that this too can be a study environment. This woman on a bench. And how can we question this and say, is this a desirable sharing and learning environment for whom and why? And then reflect and ask, who decided? What's the history of this? How did we get here? And then disrupt and suggest this too can be a sharing and learning environment. This is an indigenous sharing um, and storytelling circle at the Thunder Bay Public Library in Ontario. And think about how the form affects the outcomes here. So what spaces have shaped you? Think about that for a minute. Then dive into the experiential. You're all staring up here because this has taken primacy. If we use a board, it takes primacy. I did a co-design event where we were trying to do the information architecture for a very complicated website, and a woman got frustrated doing it. We were all doing it individually, and we we're going to put it together afterwards. She, she was using a notebook. She said, I don't have enough space. Can I use the board? And I said, sure. She went up to the board, and as soon as she did that, everybody dropped their pencils and turned. It was automatic. This is the priority. So she did all of her writing in white, and you can see it's intersectional. It's messy. It's collaborative. It's creative. And we started to fold other people's ideas into that as well in different colored chalk. And then the next day, the committee needed to present this to the stakeholders to present our ideas to them. And what did we do? <laughs> we flattened those ideas. We formalized them. We were seeking validation. And this is how we presented the outcomes of that collaborative architecture section. We dressed up that creativity, combed its hair, gave it a starched button up and some serious shoes. And we put it into outline form. And in doing that, we lost all the great work we had done. The people who weren't at the design session began questioning the taxonomy of what we'd done and got bogged down in the form and function we'd created. And we lost all of this. The lens matters. Our context was all of us sitting together in the room on the board and then on the phone, how do you communicate that? Edward Tufte calls this the problem of the flatlands, and it motivated him to create his own publishing house so he could publish his books. He wanted to have marginalia. He wanted to have 3D pop-ups in his books. He wanted spans across two pages. He wanted to break out of the grid. He's stuck in the flatlands or the typical published page. He said, look, the world is complex, dynamic, multidimensional. The paper is static and flat. How are we supposed to represent the rich visual world of experience and measurement on mere flatland? He questioned the piece of paper and said, wait a minute, that piece of paper is predisposing us to that outline form, to losing all that creativity. So thinking outside of that, how would you disrupt that? One more, the interactional. I was looking online for images that would capture this moment, that touching moment where somebody has an impact on you. Something happens to you that changes you and the other person. And you can imagine finding that moment in an image is difficult. Many of the images involve animals, as does this one. This is Jane Goodall and a chimp touching each other. In moments like these, both of them change. They both are impacted by this touching interaction. And we've all had that one person. We remember their name, the moment, when they reached out to us, gave us breakfast, changed us forever in that moment, they believed in us, encouraged our love of reading, said they liked the way that our minds worked, they liked the way that we thought about things, they believed in us. Those moments don't scale. Those are human moments. They're not scripted, they're authentic. They're connections. And no wonder it's hard to find these online. How would you use metadata to capture this. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> metadata. <laughs> 
So what do we do when no one's watching? Someone snapped this picture of this man giving his shoes to a homeless man and then walking off barefoot down the street. And we see plenty of examples like this, people who have an impact on another, people who touch someone else. The Toronto Public Library has this really cool program where you can check out a person. Eh? <laughs> what if the stories that we tell, the narratives, the anecdotes come from an elder? What if we can learn about something historical from the lived experience of someone? You can check out a person. And those interactions that live with us historically aren't always good ones. On the left here, we have Emmett Till, August of 1955, lynched for apparently whistling at a white woman in her family store in Mississippi, and on the right, Devin Myers, August 2019, Royal Oak, Michigan. A white woman called the cops on him because he was looking at her suspiciously. Interactions like love patches and painful scars live with us for a long time. Spend some time thinking about the interactions that have shaped you, the positive and negative ones alike. Those love patches, painful scars. I think we need to let go a little bit. We need to know ourselves. It starts with self-awareness. All this awareness requires that you're tuned in to your thinking, feeling, and doing and the way you do things. The where you've been, the, where, the why you were there, and why you think the way you do is a lot of self-reflection. Do you listen more than you talk? Are you a contrarian? Are you sure someone with an open container near a computer is going to spill it? Do you fetishize data and make no decisions without it? Do you bend your data to justify the purchase of just one more bicycle? Do you consider the unintended consequences of your choices or your actions? Do you stop to think about how your choices impact others, not just your family, maybe your neighbor, the next generation? Where do you scope your sphere of concern? How far do you reach? How deep do your ethics, your faith, your integrity, your self-perception require you to go? When are you com comfortable stopping? The truth is, <laughs> the machine's not going to save us. The machine has no brain. Use your own. So what happens when we resist the grid? We go to the middle. Resist the urge to generalize and instead understand the inv individual in her context with the tools available to her and the goals that she has. This is all we are. And this is how we redefine disability. Disability is a mismatch between the individual, her goals, and the tools available to her at the time. It's not something that is specific to the individual and her health. It's not the medical model, it's the environmental model. We create barriers. So the person with one arm, the person with an arm injury and a brand new parent have something in common. Find those cross-cutting similarities. Resist the urge to know an individual. One of the most wonderful things about us is we can change. We can change overnight. We can change from one moment to the next. So if we're sitting there thinking about what's best for you in a well-meaning committee, we need to stop that and we need to give you the opportunities and the context, the form that will allow you to function in the most autonomous way to exercise your agency, to be curious. Resist the urge to design for. There's a whole website, Pinterest, built around people doing their own stuff. So here you've got kids, rain boots, used as planters on a fence, as an example. And you've got Legos built around a lamp to shine light in all these different directions. Engineers aren't the only ones who can fix things. Technology can't solve it all. People know what's best for them. And instead of the 80%, study those extremes. Look at the 20%. Innovation hides in the 20. The edge cases. Look for failures, not success. We're so programmed to ignore failure. It's that dirty word. Who decided? What's the history? How did we get here? Don't forget how we design matters and every decision is a design decision. And beware of these things, taxonomies, that kind of sorting and categorizing into buckets. Beware of the binary, that dichotomization we need to stop. Beware of certainty. 
explore ever more the truth for right now without nihilism. Be aware of completion. Inclusion isn't ever complete. It's something that we've got to do every day. It's like bathing, as Florence Kennedy said. Freedom's like taking a bath. You've got to keep doing it every day. So is inclusion. It's a value. It's never a checklist. And it's measured by seeing how inextricable it is from everything we do. So your work begins now and it never ends. You might say, well, where do we do this? What decisions do you make? Remember, the decisions are the ones that have an impact on somebody else. Those are the design decisions that you're making. Anybody work with any of these things? Classroom setup tools, admissions decisions, cost, books, pedagogy, the syllabus, access, availability, assessment, equivalence, language. These are all the decisions you make. This is where the design opportunities are. The questioning, reflecting, and disrupting starts here. So the on-syllabus, what would it look like? Could it be co-created? Could it flex? What method could we use to develop it differently? What if adherence to that rule is failure and deviation is success? What would that look like? We know that success does not look like that neat little arrow. And above all else, question everything and don't ever stop. I hope some of this made sense. Thank you. Two things. Has everybody got their two things? Who wants to share? I'm actually really curious about the syllabus part. <laughs> yeah? Because um, you, you came back to that a lot. And where I come from, there's a syllabus template, which I hate. <laughs> um, so, like, I guess I'm looking for ideas. Like, but what can I do better? Or what can I do differently? <laughs> So tap into your self-awareness. For me, whenever somebody gives me a template, I, I feel like a, a, a contrary 10-year-old. I don't want to do it just, just because it's a template. I mean, I come by it honestly. I don't do it just to be a pain in the neck. But I know that it doesn't fit what I might want to do. And so I might say, what's the cost of me not using this template? Are they going to kick me out? <laughs> What's the worst case scenario? And then think about the syllabus. We want students to be creative, right? We know that creativity and critical minds are really important. But the syllabus is almost like a legal contract. We try to cover our asses so far into either direction that nobody could ever come up and claim that they don't know why they got a 17% instead of a 19%. What does it matter? Seriously, what does it matter? So I know that that's, that's glib and that's easy for me to say. It matters sometimes. So um, I said this very glibly, and somebody who taught um, veterinary assistance said to me, wait a minute, I can't just not grade. It matters whether somebody can hit a vein in an animal or not to take blood. And I said, you're absolutely right. We should me measure those things that we know we can measure and that are really important to measure. That's an easy one. Check or no check, you can hit a vein. But those three students who graduated from your program and you just wrote letters for to get jobs, I'm sure that those were not form letters. I'm sure you said something about their ability to empathize with an owner. Because quite frankly, if my animal is sick, I, I'm, I'm assuming you can take blood from the vein. The question is, can you also help alleviate my fears and my worries and my anxiety? That's a human concern that has nothing to do with a checkbox. And I suspect you're talking about students and how, how, you know, how good they are with people, how easy they are in um, a stressful situation. So one of the first ways to start is, what are we maybe not measuring? What are we maybe not including in the syllabus that needs to be in there? What are we valuing? What are we measuring in the students? And are we doing it to cover our asses or are we doing it because it matters? 
10% participation, who does that exclude? Right? Somebody who works three jobs and is in school on the side, somebody who has a young child who gets sick, gets pink eye. You know, if one gets pink eye, the other one's going to get pink eye. Everybody gets pink eye. <laughs> so what do you do in that situation? Do you feel a pit in your stomach? Like, are we actually assessing? Do we actually know if somebody's learning or not? I think that you look at the syllabus and you ask yourself, is this like Jess's dad? Is this because I said so? So there's a colleague of ours in the open movement who adds, because I said so, to the end of every sentence in her syllabus to check. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to start. Now, what else? Yeah. I loved your example of the grids of the cities. What cultures or examples of cultures that weren't based on the grids are there and what effect did it have on the development of those cultures? Oh, I love that question. I don't know. I'm not an expert. <laughs> but I can, I can speculate, um, which I feel comfortable doing, apparently. Um, <laughs> in indigenous cultures, the circle is paramount. The circle is sacred. The circle is really important. So I'm really excited when I see something that's not a grid and is a circle. And I, I, I visited Winnipeg a number of times. My wife makes fun of me because I have this sort of fondness for Winnipeg and apparently no one else does. <laughs> um, so Winnipeg, it's kind of amazing if you follow this. Uh, I follow rabbits down holes and I get stuck. But I was in Winnipeg and I wanted to know more about Winnipeg. Winnipeg used to be the big center east to west until the Panama Canal was created. Wow, I didn't know that. That was so cool to learn that. So before the Panama Canal, it was the meeting place. People from the upper Midwest, people from the east, people from the west would all come there. And there were circles. That was the trading place. The, the, the concept was the circle. So in the last number of years, some really smart, I think, planners for the city have had the Pan Am Games there, which has brought funds into the city. And they've revitalized uh, the downtown area near the river, and they've built it in circles. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights is there on the banks of the river, and it's a circle. And these meeting places, this notion of the circle, has an impact on you. You know when you walk into a sacred place, and you're like, oh, this feels heavy. <laughs> this feels special. This feels different. I don't know. I'm sure there are studies out there that talk about the impact that it has on people when it's not grid. It makes it harder to get out of the city when there's a hurricane. <laughs> you look at New Orleans, it defies the grid, right? It's the Crescent City. It rejects the grid with its very being. But in many ways, the Army Corps of Engineers created that. Some people in power made some decisions about how the city would be arranged. The, the cool thing about grids is this. We as people know they don't work well enough. We don't always say, you go to this street and you take a right and then you take a left and you make a box. Um, we say, go to the Toyota and take a right. <laughs> go to the CVS. If you see the CVS, you're going in the right direction. We already do this kind of thing of mixing and matching. Take a look at traffic circles. They're very efficient. A lot of people don't know how to use them, but. <laughs> so maybe with circles comes some, some habit forming, some re-education, some unlearning. But look, I mean, this is from the pre-Socratics that we've assumed the grid, the Cartesian model. So I think that there are lots of ways to take a look out there, even intellectually, outside of the grid. We always talk about outside the box, right? Think outside the box. So I think that your question is an awesome one, and uh, uh, there's probably an answer in every single discipline. Yeah, other, other of your things that stuck. Yeah. So um, I was thinking about the disembodied data. I love calling it disembodied <laughs> data. Um, we were, I was speaking with some faculty here yesterday about 
being more inclusive with regard to how they design their assessments. Sure. And that just came from universal design. Yeah. And making sure that um, they could write a paper or they could do some sort of a visual presentation. Right. That, that to me kind of allows for including Right. More, more of the um, individual. That's like when you look at that syllabus and it says, write a 10-page write a essay because I said so. Is that, right. are you comfortable with that? It's not, it's not that because I said so is a bad, right? It's just a test. Is there another way you could express that? If we want creativity in students, why do we stick them in straitjackets and create this transactional event with them with the contract that is the syllabus. Just read the syllabus, it's in there. It tells you everything you need to know because we don't want the conflict, right? We don't have the student coming up and saying, yeah, but I did everything I was supposed to do. Now I'm supposed to get an A, give me my A. We've screwed education up pretty badly when it's become this transaction and it's just transactional. It's not about learning anymore. It's about giving something and receiving something. Yeah. Is it nearby? <laughs> because you have this uh, one size fits one idea, and you talked about the man who doesn't like the flat page because it doesn't go in the margins and it doesn't pop up and everything like that. And in my particular department, there are colleagues who, uh, who very often say, well, because that's the way we do it. And it has to do with stepping away from the published textbook into the use of materials that are more vibrant and more you know, and uh, so I would like, if you have the time, to come to my apartment and sit next to me. And... So I, I've ruined um, some of you. I've ruined your vision. You can't unsee some of the things that you just saw. So whether I'm sitting beside you or not, there's going to be a little me here that says, oh, that's bullshit. <laughs> they said because I said so. They said, because that's the way we've always done things. Right? Be free, people. It's no fun to do things just because that's the way you've always done it. We are smarter than that. We are more creative than that. I know it's hard to figure out how to do that in a way that scales, but just let go. What does it matter? Don't feel alone. Support one another. Send virtual hugs. Uh, you can do so much more when you relax your attention. Psychology shows us this. Relaxed attention is when you get epiphanies, when you're in the shower and you're not focusing so, so intently on something, when you take a walk, when you let your mind be a little looser. Yeah, there, was a, there was a point back here.
Yeah. Build trust, right? That's that science isn't enough. Proofs, proofs can be good right. for, your, for you in the same way that like, a lot of exercise that makes your muscles hurt feels good. Uh, but <laughs> proofs and a nice warm bath, right? <laughs> like mixing and matching, why can't we do both? Was that the school that the Ameses went to? The, yeah, the one that, All right, there was, yeah. If we are to move from teacher-centered learning to student-centered learning, what two slides would you use to start the conversation? Uh, you know, okay, so that question, and back to this question, I, I'm making light of what's going to be a tough turn. Uh, students have been taught from the beginning of their education that this is transactional. They're, they're going to react to that. They're going to push back. They're going to want their A. They're going to want their number. They're going to want their assessment. They're going to want to know that they're better than the person sitting next to them. So part of it is building that trust and helping students understand that um, there, this isn't an end in and of itself, that there's some, there's some sort of purpose to this, that this is growing their mind in the way that they think, or this is giving them skills to apply to something that's completely different. And, and some of that, I think, requires understanding students. Each student is different. So creating the space, again, the form that allows those students to be very different and to be uniquely themselves and make some decisions about how they do this. So for example, OERs do a good, a good job of this. Because they're often built in a modular way, students can decide how to follow the rabbit down the hole instead of chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. They may learn better in a different order. They may explore in a different way. But we've got a metacognition issue. We've got people who've never been encouraged to explore, who've never been encouraged to understand how they learn well. So yeah, there's tension there. I think you've got to meet people where they are, gesundheit, and help level them up. I don't think it's turning, you know, all these turning the ship, boiling the ocean, all of these things. I think that you've got to. You've got to make nudges. You've got to help people see the relaxed attention and what can come with that. And I think you get at that through experiences, right? That was that achievement experiences. People need to have experiences, whether they've proven achievement in your assessments or not. Give them experiences. Um, it, my high school took kids who were high achievers to the art um, gallery a number of hours away. Uh, my oldest sister was an achiever. <laughs> what? <laughs> Takes all kinds. And my middle sister was the one who organized the spice cabinet by color. She was the one who would have benefited from the trip to the art gallery. She didn't go. She, she, uh, went to the Sorbonne for graduate school in Paris, uh, did a master's degree um, in French and in English and art. It's just, we make assumptions and we reward sometimes the wrong things. Those kids are going to the DIA, right, for their arts education. Just touch one kid and you, you can't tell looking at a group of kids which one it's going to be. Just give them experiences. That's what we do with our kids and our dogs. We, right? we socialize them. We give them exposure to balloons and to clowns and to all of these things that could be scary. I think we just give them opportunities to explore. The internet was supposed to do that. <laughs> there was another, there was another, yeah. Uh, it, it requires a lot of open spaces and a lot of stepping back. Um, we've, we've come to do education in this way that I think um, does us a disservice too. 
the person on the stage feels all this pressure to know everything, <laughs> right? Um, be the one who's imparting something. Um, helping people build trust with each other and doing some storytelling in that and being vulnerable in that. There are some skills. There's inclusive um, facilitation that I teach as well so people can understand how to build that kind of environment where people can feel uneasy. Like I, I suspect a number of you feel a little uneasy with what I said about data and a little worried about what you're going to do when you go back and you hear that little disembodied data Jess on your shoulder. But I also think that you're okay with the journey we just took together, that um, you saw something in it that might have been fun, it might have loosened up. So I think it's combining those things, the yes and again, and I, I don't know is the answer. And I think we should be more comfortable with not knowing. And trying something, seeing how it works, try it again. There, it's something interesting we don't do. When you go into a meeting, First person that talks, meeting leader, right? And somebody, usually um, an underpaid young woman, takes the notes. Um, those, are, those are demonstrations of power, and that is our grid. That, that's us perpetuating cycles of the who, who's who and who's not who. Um, what's interesting in our meetings is we have defined a way that meetings happen. And so in inclusion, we often talk about bringing somebody to the table. If you bring someone to the table and they don't know the rules of the table, they don't know how decisions are made, they don't know how the talking happens and how you establish your presence at the table, all those things happen within a, a fraction of a second. It happens when you decide where you're gonna sit. All of you are way back there, right? It happens in all of those little micro moments of inclusion or exclusion. Imagine somebody who has been excluded for hundreds of years from making decisions about their own, their own selves, their own families, their own people, like indigenous folks, and then they're brought to the table and they're asked, so, what do you want? That's an unfair, that, that's setting people up for failure. You build the table with them. You build trust. You build an environment where people can be honest and share and be vulnerable with each other and be real. One of the things that we don't do in meetings is we don't reflect at the end of the meeting. How did that meeting feel, right? So spend five minutes at the end of the meeting. You know, that meeting didn't feel great. It felt like Bob talked the entire time. <laughs> and he said the same thing three times. And it was mostly to hear himself talk. Like, I, I just feel like we didn't get at the point. Again, who's gonna kick you out? Who's gonna say you didn't use the template? Right, so what if the meetings don't feel good? Yeah. It, it's so, maybe a follow up from that, Jill, because all I know about you before you came was that you uh, read and that you have a background in ethics. Yeah. So I've been working in a university for 26 years. Yeah. And we ask questions such as, is it efficient? Yes. How will it affect retention? Will it bring in funding? <laughs> Good, will it cause scandal? And not once have I ever heard, is this the right thing to do? Or any other ways of putting it, is this an ethical thing to do? Have you ever heard these questions in related institutions? Or any other response that comes to you? Because I think it's, these are fundamentally moral questions. They are. I have heard them. Um, and it it depends on the institution. It depends how comfortable you are questioning. Like how many, how many deans does one school need? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> um, but that, that doesn't look like an ethical question to 99% of the people, or 99 It's fear. It's fear, it's fear, it's fear. It's fear and insecurity. We all want to know that we're essential. I don't know, I don't know what you mean. You don't know what I mean. Why, do we do, why, why are we so focused on efficiency? It goes back to this, right? We're gonna focus on the economic. But we know that we want all these other things as well. You hear people talking about making a connection with your students. You've got people building 
learning management systems so that you can talk to your students through them, to build community, to connect with them, to help empathize? It's a complicated question is I guess what I'm saying. I'm not gonna fix education by saying bring up the ethical question, but you can bring up the ethical question in your meetings and say, look, we're not, we're not doing this thing and this is fundamentally about people. We should be doing something that is fundamentally about the ethics of what we're doing. We do ethics review boards for all of our research, right? What about our teaching? Yeah. <laughs> A lot of what you talked about um, kind of an entrepreneur instructor, and it's what we teach in our ENT classes. Um, and my initiative here at Delta College was to get that mindset of questioning, curiosity, failing, It's the loosening and it's also accountability. Look, I, I hope you're, you're hearing me saying it's both. It's the loosening and it's why are you doing what you're doing and revisiting that and people being critical of one another and asking those tough questions. Anybody else? Thank you again for having me, I appreciate it. <laughs>